And everybody said, Amen. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. And we thank God for bringing us together tonight. You know, I'm always amazed as we are faithfully coming to the leadership development meeting. And I pray that tonight will not be in vain in your life in Jesus' name. I pray the Lord will anoint you and prepare you for greater, greater service in the vineyard of the Lord in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for your faithful people, always available. And we're asking, oh Lord, as they are faithfully serving you, so you will also faithfully bless them in Jesus' name. We're always available for you. And we thank you, Lord, because you're always available for us. And I pray, Lord, that your blessings will go on increasing, increasing in our personal lives, in our families, in the whole church, and in the ministry of every child of God, brothers and sisters, in Jesus' name. Open our eyes once again tonight to behold wondrous things out of your word. Bless your people in the world tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we're looking at Romans chapter 12. And I'm reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That last word, service. The Lord has created us for service. We're saved to serve. Actually, as you think about the whole of creation, the whole of creation, the land, the soil, the plants, the crops, the trees, everything serves humanity. Think about the animals from the reptiles and every other thing walking on ground and those creatures in the sea, the fish, they are made, they are created for the service of man. And think about all the metals, the metals we use in making our cars, making the trays, making aeroplane, all the metals, they are created for service. They are to serve humanity. And so you understand, everything that God has created is created for service. They were created to serve God and to serve man. Vegetation serves man. Animals serve man. Man serves man. Saints of God, children of God serve God and man. The church serves God and we're to serve the world. All things render service daily. They do not suspend their service and they do not postpone their service. Everything that God has created is serving every day. They serve daily, they serve properly, they serve consistently. There is no time of, you know, being so moody and being so discouraged. And because we're in despair, and then the sun will say, I cannot shine today. And the mood cannot serve us today. And the vegetation cannot serve us today. Even the animals, they say, no, we cannot serve today. Everyone, everything serves daily, serves properly, serves consistently serves profitably and we who are children of God and were brought into the kingdom at such a time as this we're saved to serve our service has eternal value and God will reward every one of us in eternity in Jesus name Look at a verse you need to mark in your Bible Psalm 104 Psalm 104, 104. I'm reading from verse 14. In verse 14, look at this. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and the herb 
for the service of man. The herb, the crops, the plants, that's the, all the foodstuff. It causes them to grow for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. And so, if everything is serving daily and serving properly, and serving consistently and serving positively and serving properly we too as children of god were called to serve tonight we're looking at the message believers daily service of eternal value believers daily service of eternal value there are three things we're looking at number one the sanctifying experience of approved servants in Christ. The sanctifying experience of approved servants in Christ. Number two, the serious expense of appointed servants of Christ. The serious expense of appointed servants of Christ. Point number three, the saints' exploits in a prized service for Christ. A prized service, the kind of service that has real price and has real value and has great reward. The saints exploits in a prized service for God. We're coming back to Romans chapter 12. And I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The sanctifying experience of approved servants in Christ. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, the mercy that saved us, the mercy that blessed us, the mercy that sanctified us, the mercy that has given us a title for inheritance in heaven. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by those mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Your body has to be alive. Your hands alive. Your brain alive. Your eyes alive. Your mouth active and alive. Your feet alive. You have to be alive so that you can serve the Lord. You are alive physically. Not only that, you are alive spiritually. It's not a dead sacrifice, but a living sacrifice that is holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I pray your service will be reasonable. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that she may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want you to notice some words in those verses I've read to you, in those verses we have read together. Number one is the word living, living. As we have eternal life from Christ, it makes us to come alive. You know what the Bible says? That the sinner is dead in sins and trespasses. And it is as we come to Christ, he washes us in the blood. He cleanses us in the blood. And now he quickens us and we come alive. It's telling us that we must be born again. It's when we're born again, we we'll come alive. Look at another word there acceptable acceptable it says acceptable unto god there is a kind of service that's acceptable unto god and of course there's a kind of service that is not acceptable leviticus chapter 22 i'm reading from verse 20 leviticus chapter 22 and we're reading from verse 20 you want to render acceptable service unto God. In verse 20, look at what it says, but whatsoever has a blemish, that shall ye not offer, for it shall not be acceptable for you. It will not be acceptable if it has blemish. That's why we go to Calvary. That's why we are washed and cleansed in the blood of Jesus, so that he will take all the blemishes away. I pray will cleanse every one of us. And our service will be acceptable in the sight of the Lord in Jesus' name. 
come back to Romans chapter 12 verse 1. The next one we're looking at there is the word reasonable, which is your reasonable service. That means there might be people that are doing something and it's not reasonable. It's not reasonable. They give uh, the better part of their life to the, to the world and then they give a minute fraction unto the Lord. Of course, that's not reasonable. God is great and God is mighty. And because he's great and mighty, whatever we offer to him must be great, must be of value. Look at um, this uh, verse in um, Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. Acts of the Apostles chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse uh, 2. Acts of the Apostles chapter 6, we're reading from verse 2. Then uh, the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason, it is not reasonable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. He said, the Lord has given us the word. He's committed the word into our hands. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He said, teach them and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe. That's the primary assignment he gave those apostles. And he said, it is not reasonable to leave the preaching of the word, which was their primary assignment, and then to serve tables. Does that mean that it's not important to serve tables? Of course it's important. That's why they had Stephen and Philip and all the others that they chose to serve the tables. What the Lord is telling us is that you should know your primary assignment. You should know your primary calling. And it is not reasonable to leave your primary calling and then you are doing another thing. That thing may be good. That thing may be wonderful. But it's taking you away from your primary calling. It's not reasonable. Let's come back to Romans chapter 12. And I'm reading here from verse 2. It says, And be not conformed to this world and be not conformed to this world. If our service is going to bear fruit, if our service is going to be profitable, if our service is going to be reasonable, acceptable to the Lord, it must not be conformed to this world. Why? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. If our service is conformed to this world and we're serving in the wisdom of the world or the strategy of the world or the mindset of the world is foolishness in the sight of God. So it says, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God for it is written that he taketh the wise in their craftiness. They are crafty, they are deceptive. That's the world. If our service is conformed to this world, it will be crafty. It will be foolish in the sight of God. Be not conformed to this world. Romans chapter 12. Now Romans chapter 12, I'm looking at verse 2. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It says the word, it says it should be renewed. There should be transformation. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind. Somebody is going to serve the Lord and is going to serve the Lord acceptably, must have a transformation in his own life. How does that take place? When does that take place? In 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're reading from verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. You're always looking at the Lord to measure. You're always looking at the Lord to reflect your own personal life. And it says we all, as we're serving the Lord, if the service is going to be acceptable, if the service is going to be alive, if the service is going to be reasonable, if the service will not be conformed to the world, we must always be looking unto Jesus and then we are changed 
into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit will be at work in our life every time. And anything that needs to be renewed, anything that needs to be revived, anything that needs to be repaired, the Spirit is working every time so that we're being conditioned and reconditioned to give the Lord an acceptable, profitable service. Let's come back to Romans chapter 12. I'm reading from that verse 2 again. It says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing of your mind. Our mind must be renewed. Because you see, it's a mind that projects our thoughts. Our thoughts are renewed. Our thinking is renewed. Our imagination is renewed. Our planning is renewed. And our projections are renewed because our mind is renewed. Ephesians, I'm reading from verse chapter 4, reading from verses 23 and 24. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and holiness. That's what he wants for us. He will do it in our lives. He has done it already. He will do more in our lives in Jesus' name. Have you noticed that most things do not serve us well in their raw natural state anything all those things are made to serve us but they do not serve us in their raw natural state look at the crops of the field look at the food we harvest from the farm we cannot just begin to bite them like that they are raw we have to do something on them to make them edible and look at all the, look at the meat. You know, you have meat. You have to do something to that meat before it can become edible. Something must be done. There's a transformation. It's as you cook that food, there's a transformation. It's as you cook that meat, there is transformation. Have you noticed that the iron has the blocks of iron and everything you dig out from the earth, you cannot use them like that. You cannot just put them together and then you have a house and then you have a car. You have to work on the raw material. Raw things, natural things, do not serve us until they, they go through the process of transformation, the process of refinement, and they are made fit to serve. Uh, think about even ourselves. Look at our feet, look at our hands, look at our brain. The brain is there, but in the raw state, it cannot serve us until that brain will go through the process of training. Our hands, look at the person that is sewing dress. Everybody cannot just sew dress. The hands must be trained so that the hands will serve appropriately. Look at those athletes that run very well. We have the same feet that they have, but until we're trained, the raw feet and the raw material cannot serve. That's why you saying man in his natural state, man is raw. Man is uh, unqualified to serve the Lord. He cannot serve humanity without training, without learning, and without transformation. I'm sure you know there may be some people who are members of the church. They want to serve the Lord. But they say, if there is, uh, you know, we, I don't have to go to the Tuesday development uh, session. I don't have to go to a Saturday workers meeting because that takes time. Uh, of course, I want to serve the Lord. The problem is that they do not want their raw material to go through the process of training so they can serve the Lord. And earthly elements cannot serve heavenly purpose without conversion, without transformation. None of the Egyptians among the mixed multitude served any good purpose in the, with the people of Israel. We must go through that transformation. We must go through that teaching. We must go through the training. 
training and then we'll be capable in serving the Lord and we will serve the Lord in Jesus name look at it again I'm reading from Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy amen acceptable to God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that she may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God we're looking in at 2nd Timothy chapter 2 verse 19 2nd Timothy chapter 2 Verse 19, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ do what? Depart from iniquity. Can you serve the Lord without naming the name of Christ? You are singing, you name the name of Christ in that song. You are praying in the prayer warriors. You name the name of Christ in that prayer. Or you are preaching, you name the name of Christ. Or you are inviting people to Christ. You are evangelizing, you name the name of Christ. Anything you are doing of service to God, of service to the church, of service to humanity, you name the name of Christ. And it says, we must depart from iniquity. Look at verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, there's a purging, there's a sanctifying, there's a cleansing, so that we don't just say the raw material I have, the raw brain I have, even look at the members of the choir, the raw voice they have cannot sing well. They must train that voice. Look at their fingers as they play those instruments. They have to train those fingers. Anything you are going to use in serving the Lord must go through the process of training. And it, here it says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work you'll be prepared in jesus name something must come alive and then the ones that are not contributing to our service of the lord must die out so that the training the transformation is very definite we will serve the lord john chapter 12 i read from verse 24 john chapter 12 verse 24 verily verily i say unto you except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die it abideth alone the lord jesus was using this illustration for you and for me for us he says the corn of wheat must fall into the ground and die and then it will germinate and then it will bring forth fruit. It will reproduce more corn and like itself. In that verse 24, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. You'll bring forth much fruit. But something must die out. Pride will die. Self-exaltation will die. I didn't hear a good, good day. Amen. Verse 25. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that loveth his life shall lose it. You know some people, I cannot go out once it's 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. And if I go to the meeting, then we'll be closing like 8 after 8. And then for me to come back home, I don't drive in the night. I don't even walk about in the night. And so because of that alone, I cannot walk. Thank God you are not like that. I say, thank God you are not like that. The Lord will reward your sacrifice in Jesus' name. Because it says, if you love your life, you lose that life. He that hateth his life in this world for, uh, shall keep it unto life eternal. Nothing bad will happen to your life. Give it to the Lord, sacrifice it to the Lord, and the Lord will bless your service in Jesus' name. Verse 26, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant be. 
That's even that's great reward. Where I am, where you see now, where are you going? You are going there. You are getting there. Keep on serving the Lord, and where he is, there will his servant be. And then he says, if any man serve me. Some people are waiting for revelation. If any man serve me. Some people are waiting for a dream. If any man serve me. Some people are waiting for a kind of uh, visible sight so that I'll say, I saw that, I saw that. Before I can serve the Lord, if any man serve me. This opportunity is for any man. And I present myself, and I'm going to serve the Lord till the very end. It's for any man. Present yourself to the Lord, and your service will be acceptable in Jesus' name. Him will my Father honor. Him will my Father honor. It tells us in Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, we're reading from verse 74 and reading from verse 75. Luke chapter 1, verse 74, that he would grant unto us that we be delivered out of the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear. You know, some people, they don't understand why God has delivered them. He has delivered us from Satan so we can serve him. He has delivered us from our enemies so we can serve him. He has delivered us from sickness so we can serve him. He has delivered us from all the things that bound us in the past. And now we say, praise the Lord, I'm healed. Praise the Lord, I'm saved. And praise the Lord, I'm free. Why? That we might serve him. That's why you are serving him. He has delivered you. He'll keep on delivering you. He delivered us to serve. And we're fulfilling the purpose of that deliverance. And he says, that's right. Any other thing that will uh, make your life not to be what he thought to be, the Lord will deliver you. And then he says, we'll serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him. How many days? Tell me, tell me, how many days you will serve the Lord all the days of your life in Jesus' name. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 28. Hebrews chapter 12. We're reading from verse 28 to serve the Lord. You know, some people think, uh, you know, Paul was very strong. He served the Lord. And, do, you know, those apostles, they had iron constitution. That's why they served the Lord. No, not at all. Paul the apostle said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And you are what you ought to be by the grace of God. And that grace is available for you, for me. And we will serve the Lord in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 28, wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace. It's all by grace. It's all by grace. Everything the Lord has called you to do, you might feel small. You might feel uh, not capable, and you might feel ignorant. The grace of God will be sufficient in your life. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. It will make you offer an acceptable service all through your life in Jesus' name. As the days come by and as the responsibilities grow, the grace of God will be increasing your life in Jesus' name. Point number two now, the serious expense of appointed servants, the appointed servants of Christ. Appointed servants of Christ. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 6. Having then gifts differing, according to the grace that is given unto us. Grace that is given unto us. You are not an exception. Abundant grace is given unto you. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wage on a ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching. 
or he that exalteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that shows mercy with cheerfulness. As you look at those uh, verses, you see at the beginning of verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us. It's talking about the gift. We need the gifts. We need the gifts so that those gifts will help us and serve God acceptably and serve the church profitably and serve the world uh, profitably and properly as well. Look at this, number one, identify your gifts. Identify your gifts. You see there, it talks about prophesying, that is preaching. It talks about uh, faith. It talks about ministry. It talks about teaching. It talks about exhortation. It talks about uh, ruling uh, administration. It talks about showing mercy and giving. One, identify your gifts. Because one, there are different gifts. Two, there is defining grace. Defining grace is the grace of God that comes along with your gift that makes you what you ought to be. First Corinthians chapter 15, I read from verse 10. First Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Why don't you stand on that foundation? What you ought to be, as you discover your gift, as you identify your gift, then the grace to make use of that grip profitably. I am what I am by the grace of God. His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God that was given to me. Number one, Different gifts, different gifts. Identify your own. Number two, the defining grace. Number three, doing good. Doing good. Whatever you have, the gifts you have, the grace you have, the experience you have, the training you have, do good. Do good. Do good in the sight of God. Do good to the church of God and do good to the people of the world. When you preach the gospel, when you bring people to Christ, when you make them abide and stay in Christ, you're doing good. You keep on doing good in your life in Jesus' name. Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, I read from verses 9 and 10. Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Let us not be weary in well-doing. You will not be tired. You will not be discouraged. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And it says, and as we have therefore opportunity. Let us do what? As we therefore have opportunity, let us do what? do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. So, number one, identify your gifts. What's your gift? And then after you have identified the gifts, understand there are different gifts. There's defining grace and you do good with that. There's doing good. Number two, improve the gifts. Improve the gifts. Somebody has a cutlass, he has to improve on that cutlass. He has to sharpen that cutlass. Somebody has a Bible, he has to reach the Bible. Somebody has, has concordance, he has to use the concordance. Somebody has commentary, he has to use the commentary. Somebody has opportunity, he has been selected, he has been appointed to be a worker, to be a leader. You have to improve the gifts. Number one, identify your gifts. Number two, improve the gifts. So Coming back to Romans, Romans chapter 12. I read here from verse 6. In verse 6, it says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. 
Let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Number one, proportionate faith. Proportionate faith. Don't allow your gift to lie dormant inside you there. Let the gift come out and make use of that gift. And you use it, you increase it. If you don't use it, you lose it. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. Stir up the gift of God. Find the opportunity to use that gift. And always be available. Because as you do it, as you do it, and you use the gift every day, you'll be improving on the use of that gift. And it says, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. According to the proportion of faith, make sure that the faith today is higher than the faith yesterday. And the faith tomorrow is greater than the faith of today. We're reading from Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, and I read from verse 5. Read from verse 5. It says, and the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. The gift is there. But you have to allow faith to make you to use the gift. Doubting will vanish away. Wavering will vanish away. And as your faith increases, the usability of your gift will also increase. Let's come back to Romans chapter 12. And now it says in verse 7. Romans chapter 12, we're reading from verse 7. It says, O ministry, let us wait on a ministry. Or ministry, let us wage on a ministry. What does that mean? Let's focus on that ministry. The gift you have and the ministry you have, exercise that gift. Wage on that ministry. Look at that ministry and make sure that as you are concentrating, the more you use that gift, the more you will increase in the use and you will perfect the use of that gift. That's why the apostles said, look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That's waiting on their ministry. Waiting on their ministry. Concentrating on their ministry. You're not the one that is, you know, shifting from here to there. And then you're here for one month. Then you say, I think I can do better in another place. You go to another place. You're there for two months. I think I can go to another place. You're not waiting on your ministry. Always be available and wait on the ministry. Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 7. Second part, or he that teaches on teaching. It says, you wait on your ministry, and if your calling is that of a teacher, you will teach and teach and teach every time you are concentrating on teaching. You're learning how to be more effective in the teaching. You must do something about the gifts you have so that you improve on the gifts. In Proverbs chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 9. Proverbs chapter 9, I was reading from verse 9. In Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9, look at this. Give instruction to a wise man and he will yet the wiser. Give instruction to somebody who has a teaching ministry. And then he will improve on that teaching ministry. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. Teach a person who has this teaching ministry. He will increase in learning. That means as you come to the Tuesday meeting, you listen to our Sunday scripture teacher, you read the Sunday scripture booklet itself, and then you listen to uh, the overall uh, treatment of the whole chapter, and you see the approach, and you're learning from that, and learning from that. And if your ministry is that of a teacher, to teach the word of God, then you are following that line as well. Look at um, Romans chapter uh, 12, I'm reading from verse 8. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation, 
He that exhorted on exhortation. You are learning about effective exhortation. So that if somebody is having a problem and then you bring the word to exhort him, to encourage him, to lift him up, it says, praise the Lord, you came to me because your word, your exhortation has really done a good thing in me. My discouragement is gone. My problems are gone. Look at 1st Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 13. 1st Timothy chapter 4 verse 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading and to exhortation and to doctrine. Give attention to your exhortation. Don't just say the same thing uh, that you said to A and then go to B, say the same thing. Go to C, say the same thing. And go to another person, say the same thing. You're improving every time uh, on your ministry and your gift of exhortation. And then in Romans chapter 12, uh, reading from verse 8, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Simplify your giving. Simplify your giving. Don't make it complicated. There's somebody who has uh, fallen in the hands of robbers and then is lying half dead in the way. Give attention to that person. You don't have to, you know, call for uh, the, you know, city pastor, the state pastor. Somebody is lying here. I know what to do, but I cannot do it without permission. Can I help him? That's complicating giving. And that's complicating, you know, giving a helping hand. Help them, and the Lord will reward your service in Jesus' name. Somebody is hungry in our district. Somebody is naked in our district. Somebody doesn't have a job in our district. And I have what I can give. Should I give or shouldn't I give? Make it simple. Make it simple. Give to them and help them at the time they need that help. All this uh, rigmarole before I tell that leader and tell that leader and before they get permission from the overseer that, okay, I can help. The fellow might die of. Therefore, give the helping hand the moment you see that need there. The Lord will help you. And the Lord will reward your service in Jesus' name. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I am reading from verse 6. It says in verse 6, But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Every man, according as the purpose says in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly of necessity for God loveth what kind of givers? A cheerful giver. You'll be a cheerful giver in Jesus' name. When you think of what your giving can do, you give money to somebody, or you give a help to somebody, or you clothe somebody, or you give food to somebody, and because of that, they're encouraged. And because of that, they say, now I'm going to follow the Lord till I die. And even going to be like this person that is helping me. They see the grace of God in your life. And they want to increase you in the grace of God. You will lift somebody up. And those you lift up, they'll turn around. They'll lift you up to in Jesus' name. Come back to Romans chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse, uh, reading from verse 8. It says, he that ruleth with diligence. He that ruleth with diligence is talking about the people that uh, organize and the people that have administrative ability. And it says, they should do it with diligence. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you. Just talking about the fact that they are there to organize us. They are there to put us together. They are there to divide the work and say, you do this and you do this and you do that. And it says, we shall remember them, they are over us who have spoken unto you the word of God, the preachers too, the pastors too are like that, their leaders and rulers whose faith follow. Don't go a tangent, don't go off and say, he has said his own, I'm going to do my own. If everybody does like that, there'll be no unity. If everybody does like that, we will not be able to move the work forward. In unity, there is strength. Anywhere you are, there'll be unity. 
considering the end of their conversation. Look at verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. There will be no division in our midst. There will be no disunity in our midst. You will be an agent of unity in Jesus' name. Obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy. Every one of us will serve with joy. And not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Look at verse 24. Verse 24. Let's read uh, this first line. Everybody, one, two, three, go. Say that again. Salute all them that have, tell me, rule over you. Do you know there are some people, they don't greet leaders. They think uh, leaders don't need a greeting. All leaders do is to say, stand up, go down, do this, do that. We cannot even say good morning to them, good afternoon to them. We, and if they are going through problems or challenges in their lives, we cannot even visit them. And we do not, we don't understand that leaders too may have problems. Those that have rule over us, it says salute all them. No discrimination, no partiality. Salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints. We're coming back to Romans. Romans chapter 12 and I'm reading from verse 8. Romans chapter 12, we're reading from verse 8. In Romans chapter 12, verse 8, the latter part it says, And he that showeth mercy weighs cheerfulness. He that showeth mercy weighs cheerfulness. As we show mercy to people, then we're cheerful about it. You're giving somebody food, be cheerful. You're giving them clothes, be cheerful. You're giving them counseling, be cheerful. And as we do this, the Lord will bless our service to the brethren in Jesus' name. One, in this section, identify your gifts. Two, in this section, improve your gifts. Three, impact with your gifts. Impact with your gifts. Let your gift make a mark in our progress. Let your gift make a mark in doing something that is positively helping people. We're coming back to Romans chapter 12, and I read from verse 6, have been then gifts differing um, according to the grace which is given unto us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. And then it goes on. You see, there are people that say the head has all the gifts. And so the hand is important. The head has the gifts. And so the legs are kind of static. They will not walk. The, the head has all the gifts and so the lungs will not breathe. We must use our gift. There is no part of the body. Even the little finger, even the thumb, even the middle finger, and even the little toes, everyone has a purpose for which it's there in the body. And whatever you are, and whatever your gifts, you are going to be useful. I will be useful. I am useful. Say that I am useful. I am not useless in the body of Christ. Impact with your gifts. Number one, be a bridge and not a barrier. Be a bridge and not a barrier. People are moving forward and then they need to cross over to the other side and they need to have something good in their lives. Be a bridge and not a barrier. Be a doorway in and not a back door out. A doorway in so people who are coming as they see you, as they meet you, and you exercise your gift. Your gift will be to help them and make them to like to come in. Be a doorway in and not a back door out. Nobody will backslide because of you. 
help, be a help, and not a hindrance. Be a help, and not a hindrance, as we use our gifts in proportion to our faith, in proportion to our opportunities. We will be a help, will not be a hindrance in Jesus' name. Be a stepping stone, and not a stumbling block. Don't let anybody stumble by your action. Don't let anybody stumble by your carelessness. Don't let anybody stumble by, by neglecting them, looking down, them snubbing them, uh, like saying, who are you? What are you doing there? Get out of my way. They have come to the church of the living God, and they want to serve God, be an encouragement, and be a stepping stone, and not a stumbling stone. Be a builder and not a destroyer a builder and not a destroyer that's what i will be i say that's what i will be we come to point number three now the saints exploits in a prized service for god the saints exploits in a prized service for God. I'm reading to you from Romans chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 17. It says, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. As you look at uh, these uh, verses coming from, even from verse 1 to the very end, these are saints in the world. As you read from verse 9 and verse 10, verse 11, verse 12, verse 13, number 1, no dissimulation, no pretense. You are who you are. And you're very transparent. And there's no hypocrisy. Number one, no dissimulation. Number two, no slothfulness. You're not slothful in making use of your gifts. You are active. And you are available. And you are fervent in what you're doing. No slothfulness. No selfishness. You don't mind seeing just for yourself. In honor, you prefer other people. There's no selfishness. You are sold out to service. And you are sold out to serving people. No cursing. He says, when you, are, when you are persecuted, you will not curse. You will bless all the time. There's no pride. There's no pride. You're not pushing down other people, stepping on other people. And there's no self-exaltation. No self-exaltation. It says, you will not mind high things. There's no retaliation. Somebody has done something against you. There's no retaliation. There is no wrath. There is no anger. There is no revenge. There is no evil. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Those are saints in the world. You carry that character and you carry that understanding to all the places of work where we are working. There's a saint there in the office. There's a saint there in the market. That is the negative part, what you are not. But these are saints in Christ cleaving to goodness. Cleave to that which is good. Anything that is good is part of your life. It's part of your nature. Doing good has become part of your second nature. If you see anything that needs to be corrected, you correct it right there because goodness has become your second nature. You are kind and you are loving. You are honoring other people. In honor, in honor, preferring one another. You look at a brother, you look at a sister. Maybe I know something she doesn't know. And maybe she can do something to you I cannot do. And you look at what they can do, which you cannot do. You honor them for that. You are fervent. You are fervent. Anything you put your heart into, you do it. You don't do it sluggishly. You don't do it haphazardly. Your life is there. Your mind is there. You are fervent. Not only that you are serving. Not only that you are, you are patient in tribulation. And you're giving and you're hospitable you're hospitable anything you can do to make life easier for another person anything you can do to make the christian life enjoyable to people you're very thoughtful you're meek you're lowly and you're humble you are peaceable and you are self-forgetting, self-forgetting. You don't think about yourself. What just can I do to make him happy? What can I do to encourage him? What 
can I do to make him want to do more for the Lord? You are cheerful and you are serving others. The question is, where are such saints? If we have such saints in the office, such saints in the community, will transform the community. Look at this now. I'm reading from Romans chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as it lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, children of God, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto all. For it is reaching, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his said, Be not overcome of evil, but do what? Overcome evil with good. Let me just show you a few examples of those saints that did like that and they had a positive ministry and you will have a positive ministry. Genesis chapter 50, I'm reading from verse 15. Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. When Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil we did unto him. They realized they did evil to Joseph. Now, how was Joseph going to react? How was Joseph going to, you know, play his own game? Look at uh, verse 20 now, or verse 19. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God to take vengeance? Fear not, am I in the place of God to judge you? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. He said, my position is to save much people alive. My gift is to save much people alive. I forget the past. I'll take care of you. There is nothing for you to fear. That's what Romans chapter 12 is telling us. Whatever people have done or said against us, have the mind to serve so that you'll be a person that gets so saved into the kingdom in Jesus' name. We're looking at Exodus chapter 32. And I'm reading from verse 9. Exodus chapter 32, verse 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Remember what uh, Romans chapter 12 is telling us, that you don't mind high things, and you, in honor you prefer other people, and then you don't, uh, you're not going to retaliate. Look at what these people have done. They destroyed all the effort and the labor of Moses while he went to the mountaintop. And now God said, they're stiff neck, I'll destroy them, and I'll make you a great nation. Uh, look at this in verse 11 now. And Moses besought the Lord is God and said, Lord, why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt, and with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the in the mountain and to consume them from the face of the earth turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people then remember and then he goes on verse 14 and the lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people you know he could have said it serves them well they're rebellious, they're stiff-necked, 
They're disobedient. And look at what they have done. They've gone to worship idol, and God wants to destroy them now and make me a great nation, a better nation. But Moses said, no, I don't want to be a greater nation at the expense of these people. Forgive them. That should be the way we use our gifts. We use our gifts to make other people acceptable unto God. Look at um, Psalm 35. Psalm 35, I'm reading from verse 11. In Psalm 35, verse 11, look at what it says over here. False witnesses did rise up, they laid to my charge things that I knew not. Remember, when they curse, you bless. When they persecute, you pray for them. You are not going to retaliate. The psalmist said, they have risen up against me and they laid things to my church I didn't know. They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. Look at verse 12, 13. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. If somebody is sick in the district, somebody has a problem in the district, and now they're calling you, Pastor, Pastor, come. Look at this person. Who is that? The so-and-so. He never shows up for workers' meeting. He never listens to leadership. And when we say we're going to do this, he never contributes anything. Now he's sick and he's looking for help. You go and tell him what you saw you're going to reap as you have neglected us in the district and you have opportunity of doing this and that and you did it, we will not pay attention to you. The psalmist said, no. He said, no. Look at what they have done against me and look at what I'm going to do now. As for me, in verse 13, when they, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting and my prayer returned to my own bosom. Look at verse 14. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend. He has been acting like an enemy. He has been acting like I don't care for the progress of the district or the progress of the state work. But when he became sick, I bowed down myself heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. That's what we ought to do. That's the way we ought to do the work of God. And whatever it is uh, that other people have done and we were not happy about, we'll say, I'm going to serve all the same. I'm going to make use of my gift profitably to help the church of the living God and to help the people of God. God will give you more grace. God will give me more grace. Uh-huh. Look at that. Amen. Amen. We will serve one another profitably in Jesus' name. And look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15. And I will very gladly, cheerfully spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love, the less I be loved. That's the attitude of a real believer, of a real minister. Even though they love you less, even though they have not pulled up to their wage, when they get into problems, you'll serve them. Your gift will serve and you're glad that, you know, the rain falls on everybody, the just and the unjust. And you're glad that, you know, the plants and the, and the cattle and everything, they're serving us. They're not looking at, you know, whether we're frowning or smiling or whatever. Everything is serving us and the sun is shining for everybody. Our gifts will be like that. You will not discriminate in using your gift. You will not be partial in using your gift. You will contribute something happy, something wonderful in everybody's life with your gift in Jesus' name. And as you do, your reward will be great. On earth, the Lord will reward you. In heaven, the Lord will reward you. And everything you lay your hand upon will prosper in Jesus' name. Be available for to serve everyone, and everyone will be available to serve you eventually in Jesus' name. We're looking at Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man 
as this work shall be. The way you are using your gift, the way you are using your talent, I'll give every man as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates unto the city. You will enter heaven at last in Jesus' name. This is a period of service. The period of reward is coming. Rise up and tell the Lord, I will serve the Lord. I'll serve the Lord. I have more light now. I have more understanding now. I know what the character should be. I know what my consecration should be. And I know to, to put all my gifts to serve the people of God and to serve even the world and bring them to salvation. Open your mouth and tell the Lord, I will serve. I'll do acceptable service, rewardable service.